the elitists all have these kind of progressive Marxist views, but they don't actually live those out. And rather, they do trickle down to the underclass where they act them out. And it kind of creates this, you know, disparity between the elite, a, a greater disparity between the elite and the lower class because the lower class has taken on those values that the, that the elites say they appreciate, condone, whatever, but they actually don't practice. They just trickle on down to the, the lower class. Um, the underclass, whatever you want to call them, the low-income populations, um, like divorce. There, there's no, there are no. I would say out of 32 kids that I have, I would say maybe three have intact families, maybe three. Hello, everyone, and welcome to the second episode of this year of Girl Boss Interrupted. I'm your host, as always, Helen Roy. Uh, so let's just jump right into it. January, as I've said, is about psychology. And so today I am speaking to Going Godward, a mother and counselor for children in the public school system in small town Pennsylvania. She is a writer and an aphorist whose thoughts become viral tweets not infrequently. And we are going to be talking about something that is unpopular to say out loud, at least, and will probably make a lot of people fairly uncomfortable. This is daycare, the industrial outsourcing of childcare, uh, daycare as a norm, daycare as an industry, daycare as the expectation. And here's the sticky spot the effects of mass daycare on the mental and emotional health of our children and their mothers. The topic of our conversation is, in my view, a sort of quiet cost that we as a society tend to write off without question as good and necessary for the fact that it enables the so-called economic liberation of women. But if you want to understand anyone's mental health, let alone the society-wide crisis of mental health that we are seeing play out, I think it's fair to go back to the beginning and interrogate some of these things that we take for granted. So that's what we've done here today. To prepare for this podcast, Godwin and I read Being There by Erica Kamizar, a book, a fantastic book, actually, that we cite and that I will link in the description box below. This is, this is one that I'm going to be giving out at baby showers from here on out. I mean, it's so compassionate but unyielding in um, its advocacy for the psychological needs of children. So, as always, thank you for listening, liking, sharing, and subscribing. If you're on YouTube, make sure to hit that notification bell so you never miss an update from your favorite podcast on women's issues, Girl Boss Interrupted. Chat again in two weeks. Bye now. All right. I am so excited about this one. This is going to be this is going to be fun. Uh, everyone, going Godward is here, and if you're hey, everyone, <laughs> if you're familiar with my Twitter account, then you definitely are familiar with hers. You sort of operate in the same circles in that world. So, um, yeah, I wanted to talk to Going Godward about her work with children. Um, as I've spoken about this this month, is about uh, psychology and 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 mental health in this this world that uh, liberal feminism has created. Um, and she works with children. So that's that's what we're focusing on today is is the psychology of children and the despair of children and how that um, becomes an adult's life. So yeah, let's let you take it away. Can you tell us a little bit about what you do, how you got into it, and your your journey in that world? I would love to. So I uh, grew up in a little rural town in uh, Appalachia in Georgia. Um, came from a really close-knit family, two parents, two younger brothers, just a really enriching childhood. Um, grew up kind of in a low church Protestant denomination, kind of moved in a different direction spiritually um, as I got older. Um, but really great family, really great childhood. Um, 
got married really young, had children really young, and was a homemaker for several years. Um, as my boys got older, I kind of moved into facilitating mom groups in my home, um, especially before my boys were old enough to do schooling and that kind of thing. We would have play groups in our home. We would lead, I would lead book clubs or book groups. Um, sometimes we had like CD parenting seminars and stuff like that. We would just do in home. The kids would play. We would just, you know, as moms, hold on, I got to go, you know, do that kind of thing. Um, did that for a few years. Um, then I was hired as a family's private tutor. Um, a homeschooling family. Um, they were five then, they're six now, but um, six children now is five then. And I did private tutoring for a while, then moved into, um, as my boys got older, I took on, you know, more things outside of my home that I could give my attention to because they were becoming more independent. And I was a client advocate at a women's center. So women who were, young women who were abortive, abortion-minded, who had changed their minds, chosen life, we provided care for them through their pregnancy and through the first year of their lives. So, or first year of the baby's lives. So we did parenting classes. Um, we had systems set up where if moms came to parenting classes, if they took their babies to their well check visits, if they took them to the library, whatever they did that was enriching or good for their babies, they got mommy bucks. So they could get diapers. They could get baby items, whatever they needed. It was just really great enrichment program. And um, I did that for a while. Then I moved states, um, started working with refugee populations. Didn't really foresee that, um, but that ended up being a really great experience. A lot of eye-opening yeah. experiences in that role. Um, worked to resettle families who were moving here from all over the world. Um, from that, I moved into early childhood, and that's where I have been for the majority, well, I would say the majority of my career, like especially the last five or six years, mm. um, working with um, families, young children, and I am a school-based therapist um, for a Title I district in um, Central PA, and I work there with middle school children, and I have um, some elementary school kids in my caseload as well. So um, that's kind of the journey and progression to working with families and children. Um, and something I just started seeing, um, particularly about five or six years ago in working with, with families, particularly mothers, a lot of single moms, a lot of low-income populations, um, just kind of what I would have thought would have been natural, like this is what, this is what you do as a mom, it just kind of comes natural. I kind of saw moms not really having that natural bend or not really feeling like it was their responsibility to do certain things. So I would have kids show up not having any self-care skills, you know, couldn't couldn't put their coat on, couldn't put their shoe on, couldn't do anything like that. They couldn't write their name. They didn't know a letter. They didn't know a color. They didn't know a shape. They just had nothing. And, you know, when I would have meetings with moms, I would say, you know, how... Are you working with her, writing her name at home? Because these moms had placed their children in programs pretty much because they didn't want to take care of them. They were, they were federally funded programs and they just had placed them there because they felt it was not their responsibility any longer once their child reached a certain age that they weren't supposed to do anything with them, I guess. And what was that so they age? Moved them into these, uh, about four. Good God. Yeah, about age four. And um, so we would, we would, I would have meetings with moms and they would say, well, that's, you know, that's their job. That's your job. That's the school's job. That's the preschool's job or whatever to teach them those things. And I, it was just kind of a, wow, I, I didn't realize that people really felt that way. Um, and later I, I met with a friend earlier this year and she said, how can I help these kids? Like, how can I minister to them? What can I do? And I said, minister to the moms. I feel like there has been this lack of love that has developed somehow it's like these moms unfortunately don't really know how to love their children they don't know how to care for them probably because they were not cared for they were not nurtured they didn't have mothering modeled for them and so they're just kind of passing down this kind of neglectful hands-off it's not my, my responsibility mothering and I sound like I'm being critical but I actually feel so much compassion for them and I want to just gather them all up and be like, you are the best mom for your child. Mm -hmm. You can do this. You can raise them into adulthood and they can be productive, wonderful members of, you know, society. And um, 
you shared a book with me that I, that I read, um, Erica Commissar. Is that how you say her name? Commissar? Being there? Um, I think and so. She this book. <laughs> I hope so. Yeah, that's being how there, I, right here. No, the, uh, yeah. Commissar. Yeah. I, I don't yeah. know how to pronounce that, but that's how I've been yeah. pronouncing it. So I hope that's I right. Com Commissar? Commissar? Yeah. yeah. She's written this book about <laughs> the importance of the first three years of a child's life and how important it is for moms to be present as much as possible in those formative years. So um, I just was really grateful that she wrote this book and I wish I'd had it several years ago when I was working with young moms because um, just reading that and seeing the literature and seeing someone talk about the impression that you're making on, their, on your child in those first few years, you know, they're interpreting reality through you. I mean, you're, you're bringing reality to bear on their lives and how you respond to reality um, affects how they respond to reality. If you are, you know, angry, grumpy, anxious, whatever, they're kind of, they're kind of reading your emotions and they're responding. So it's a great book, especially for young moms. I will say this, I was reading it and I thought, whew, if I'd read this whenever I was a young mom, I'd probably been so stressed out. I'd be like, okay, I'm not doing this. I need to do this more. So I would say, if you're a young mom and you love your child and you want what's good for your child, you're you're going to be fine. Mm -hmm. um, you know, don't stress out over, am I talking to my child enough? Am I playing with them enough? If if you're there and you're present and you love them and you want what's good for them, it's it's going to be okay. I think this is a really valuable book for women who maybe didn't have good mothering modeled for them and could use some just tune up um, in motherhood. So I highly recommend that. So I'm a school-based therapist for, going back to that, for, for women, for women, for children who have been referred for mental or behavioral concerns. Um, so I have about 30-ish kids that I see on a regular basis. What is the... Uh, nature of their behavioral issues, generally speaking. Nature of their behavior, what? I'm sorry. Their behavioral issues. I mean, like, what, what, what kind of behaviors are they displaying? Okay, so classroom destruction, um, excessive profanity toward teachers or peers, um, some criminal behavior, um, a lot of, uh, fight, like, initiating fights or something after school, um, they call it beef, beefing with people and then, and then starting, uh, physical altercations off campus, mm -hmm. um, stealing those types of things, poor peer relationships, just unable to really form friendships to form proper bonds, um, poor social skills. I mean, um, this is something I've actually wanted to write about with the whole masks that came about in 2020 when kids were forced to wear masks, it was you know, for their health or their safety with, with their health. But, and people talked about, oh, you know, children who were learning to speak, they're not going to be able to see their mouth move. There were all kinds of things, all kind of, all kinds of negative consequences of masks. Well, now we're on the other side of masks and nobody's really wearing them anymore, except the kids who are very insecure already and have kind of poor social skills. It's a way of hiding for them. So they love masks because it's another layer of hiding, of covering up insecurities. And it's, I think, a consequence that maybe people didn't really consider. Um, there's this psychological, social component now with it that I don't think people anticipated. So they can use it as a way of hiding insecurities. And I think that's really unfortunate rather than coping with those feelings and thinking about them and, and reflecting. It's just like, I'm going to put a mask on because I, I want to be hidden. I don't want to be seen. Mm. And I think that's really interesting. So yeah. those types of behaviors, really antisocial, yeah. um, aggressive, a lot of anger. Yes. Things like that. Um, a lot of my students have uh, families who have been incarcerated, parents who have been incarcerated. So they've seen their family be broken and dad's gone off to jail for five years and missed a whole part of their development or mom is in and out of their life and that causes a lot of attachment problems and that manifests in all sorts of behavioral ways yeah yes um 
do you do are you ever able to talk to the children about their relationship with their parents i mean have you ever been able to about what i'm sorry about their relationship with their parents um oh yes that is a freak yes that's a frequent conversation that we have um so a lot of times i talk about the family dynamic you know there's a lot of questions of tell me about your relationship with your mom like what's that like um if you how would you describe your mom how would your mom describe you? You know, do you fight a lot with your mom? Um, do you have, what's your first memory with your mom? Um, sometimes that first memory they have with mom might be really negative or with dad, it might be really negative And that's just kind of set the tone for their relationship with them. That's kind of gone through their whole life. Um, and again, if, if mom or dad had not seen, you know, good parenting modeled for them, they're just repeating poor parenting in their own family's lives. I have a lot of families who it's just high stress, high conflict. Um, Bowen, Murray Bowen, he was a family therapist. He developed this theory called Bowen Family Systems Theory. And he used this scale. It's a differentiation scale. And the higher differentiated you are, the more you're able to withdraw from a situation that's that's a lot of conflict, it's emotional, you're able to pull yourself back to differentiate yourself and say, okay, this is going on in front of me, this is high conflict, but I'm okay, I'm stable, I'm not going to be emotionally sucked into this um, conflict. I can kind of separate myself. And that's, you go all the way up to 100, like 100 be like the most differentiated. So then the bottom of the scale is called being fused. So a highly fused person or a highly fused family is someone who cannot separate themselves from the conflict, from the emotion. They're kind of, I call it the anxiety or conflict vortex, and they kind of get sucked into it and they just can't get out of it. And Murray Bowen said that the most anxious person in the family is the one that everyone's orbiting around. And if you have a, a, and not necessarily anxious, like, oh, I'm just so worried, but maybe that person generates a lot of conflict. Mm -hmm. Maybe they um, have addiction, things like that. There's all kinds of things. It doesn't necessarily have to be anxiety. Like we think of anxiety. It can be someone who is struggling with all sorts of things, but that person kind of controls the entire family and everyone responds to that. So what I'm trying to do is take children who are typically in very fused families, children who are very fused, and move them up that differentiation scale. Like I'm trying to teach differentiation to say, I know these circumstances are terrible. Mm. I know they're awful. And I know when your mom screams at you or screams at dad and the police come, I know that's really awful for you. I know it's terrible. Like validating how terrible that is for them to have to witness, but saying, you can step back from that. You can tell yourself the things that are true and just work on that a lot. And that takes a long time to undo. And it's really hard when you're sitting there with a child who is telling you really horrible things and you've got them for an hour, maybe two hours a week at most. And then, you know, you're sending them back into that environment. So it's like, okay, I'm going to do this for an hour and then I'm going to send you back into like the most toxic environment, which is also their school setting as well. So you feel a little bit like your work is, you know, pointless sometimes. Um, but often I have, I have learned that kids really just want to be attuned. They want someone who is going to attune to them, who is going to see who they are, validate their feelings and say, I know this is terrible and it doesn't have to be this way. It shouldn't have to be this way. Um, so that's kind of the context of, pretty much every session <laughs> all the time with Man. kids. Yeah. That is gutting. Do they come to you for hugs? For like physical yes. affection? So, yes. And you know, there is this boundary that you have to maintain with students, especially, you know, I'm a female and I have teenage boy. We're not really having those interactions. Um, but the girls especially are you know, most of my girl clients, they hug me every single time they see me. And especially like the littles that I see, I do give them a lot of, you know, affection and praise when I can, because I know that no one is doing that at home. So. Oh, golly. Um, yeah. It's, it's unfortunate. It's, it's really sad. And I, I think sometimes like on Twitter, I sometimes I talk about these things and I, 
try to explain to people um, the context. And so much of Twitter, I feel like people are living in a bubble. Not, and I don't, I'm not being critical, but there are so many things that are going on that are just so, so bad um, that they could not conceive. And so people sometimes are flipping about abuse and they, they get mad about victim culture and things like that. And we do live in a, in a culture that has completely misused the term. They've overused it and it doesn't get used in the right um, way anymore. And they just don't know that there really are horrible, horrible abuses and terrible things that go on. And children are really suffering and families are really suffering. Yeah. So, yeah. Sorry, I know that's like so doom and gloom, no. but I just kind of want to give like a reality check. Like it, it's real bad. No, it's yeah. just so bad. I mean, yeah, yeah, it is. I mean, the culture is really in a bad way. Um, and I, while I do agree and, and certainly recognize the way that uh, victimhood has been weaponized by, and, and not even real victimhood, but false victimhood has been weaponized by extremely mm -hmm. narcissistic, mm -hmm. manipulative Machiavellian people. That's true. Um, yes. But, yes. but, but I acknowledge what you're saying too. And I, I, I think that yes. I, the way that I kind of see it in a way that the thing that makes me upset is that so much of this dysfunction has been glorified and normalized in the culture, you know, and, and I know people have always been talking about oh, rap music and no, this and that. And it's like, yeah, I'm going to sound like a crusty reactionary for just a second, but seriously, like this sexual dysfunction and the family dysfunction, all of this has been normalized such that I think children don't, cannot identify when something is wrong. And that is like, Correct. when there's a trauma that has happened to you, the first step, in my view, in sort of overcoming that and recognizing it and being able to manage it mentally is to be able to be mm -hmm. brutally and radically honest about what happened and to really mm -hmm. deal with the full gravity of the evil, which you can't yes. do if it's Correct. just, if, you, if, if we're living in a culture of, you know, pornography where... And I know these kids are, have access to pornography and watch it and they, you know, it, it just yes. messes with people's minds. And then, yes, correct. you know, like I knew girls who had been watching pornography since they were eight years old. And then people mm -hmm. start rumors in like fifth or sixth grade, like, oh, she's having sex. It's like, well, she's 12 years old. Yes. She's not having yeah. sex. She's, mm -hmm. that's, you know what I mean? So, um, yes. That's, you know, especially not with a 21 year old guy, that's called rape, man. But, um, right. Any, right. anyway, I just started to get back to what we're talking about. No, here. that's, that is, you're absolutely, no, you're absolutely right. And I'm so glad that you said that. And that's what, you know, I'm in a secular setting. I'm not in a religious setting. So I don't have the liberty to be like, the Lord will take care of you. He will fight for you. Like, I can't bring that into conversation but if a child does bring up God or like I was praying or something, even if they're not religious, sometimes they, they do get to that desperate spot where they're like, I prayed and asked God to tell me in my heart, you know, that kind of thing. And so I use that as an opportunity to say, you know, so you did pray and did, you know, how did God respond to that? You know, to try to, to try to encourage that. And I can't use heaven unless they bring it up. I can't use heaven and I can't use, um, like religious terminology. So what I typically do is I'll say, if you could imagine your ideal self, what does that self look like? If you could imagine an ideal family, what does that family look like? Because like you're saying, they don't even know what is good. <laughs> they don't have a concept of what is good. They've only seen evil and they've only seen terrible things and trauma. So helping them to envision what is good and the ideal self, which I would say that their heavenly self to, to imagine what their ideal self would look like and then move toward that um, is what I'm trying to do. I'm trying to call forth that self that would be in heaven. Mm -hmm. That's, that's what I want for them. And that's what I'll tell them. Sometimes I don't know what I, I don't know. I can't imagine. I said, well, do you want me to say that you, do you want to be a mean person? Do you want to be a person who, you know, does these things? I try to give them like the negative. 
So when they say, I don't know who I want to be. Well, you know, you don't want to be this person. Mm -hmm. So let, what are some opposite things of that? Like if you don't want to be someone who steals things, do you want to be someone who is generous and who is giving, you know, that kind of thing. So whenever children can't, I'm so glad you said that. It really is orienting them to the good, to, to beautiful things. And what I see a lot of is they are so drawn to the profane. They love death. I mean, it is just such a culture of death. Not death like physical death, like more, but but dark, morbid, like just what Philip Reeve said, you know, his life among the death works. I mean, everything they do is just a death work. It's just the stuff they watch, the stuff they listen to. It's just all death works. And they don't know how much they love death and how much they love just profane things. And so I try to bring in music, literature, things like that that are beautiful so that they can start to be exposed to that and hopefully be able to discern what is profane and what is beautiful so that they can move toward what is beautiful and what is good. Um, again, this is all in a secular context, so it's a little trickier. You can't bring God, um, but you can get close. Oh, and when they give me subtle. that little that's very... that little nugget of God, I can like jump in there and say something. Yeah. I just can't introduce it myself, but I wait with bated breath for that one moment where they say, I prayed or I went to church when I was three or whatever, you know. Yeah. So it's good. Wow, that's mm -hmm. that's um, that's very strategic. I can appreciate that, certainly. I mean, you are doing the Lord's work, even if you have to do it indirectly. <laughs> um, wow. Yeah, it's a priestly I mean, I know that women are not priests, but it is a very priestly kind of pastoral kind of job because you really do see what is it? The Miserables, Les Miserables. I mean, you really do see the people who are um, the underclass. I think Theodore Dalrymple called them the underclass. I mean, you really do see a different population that most of us have been sheltered from. Yeah. Yeah. Well, it seems what I, what I was thinking as you were talking is that your role is deeply maternal, actually. It's sort of this, um, it seems to me like this uh, answer to like a lost motherhood or I, I mean I don't want to call these mothers failures I don't want to be cruel to them but um, there is a sort of negative space where that uh, the, the the caring mother should have been and should have um, instructed them in in the sort of discernment of uh, spirits discernment of their emotional state of uh, you know, just getting getting through life, getting those, those very basic emotional skills that we learn as toddlers, or that we should. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, I feel like you're you're filling in the gaps in this like deeply maternal sense. It feels like a, you know, I mean, not that men couldn't do it, obviously, but there, it's it seems like a really beautiful vocation for a woman. I would say yes, especially for ages like under fourteen, which are they? I do five to 14. Yeah. And, um, usually though with the boys, when they get a little bit older, that, that kind of 13, 14 age, I do think a man would be preferable in those cases. Yeah. Um, so what I really try to do in those situations, we I play chess all the time, anything that's competitive where they can kind of, um, compete with me, maybe beat me in a game or something like that. Um, play basketball, things like that. I don't play basketball, but I will do that for them because, you know, they, they need to be doing that. They don't want to just sit there and talk about their feelings like most girls do. They want yeah. to be doing something. They want to be competing. So chess and basketball are probably my two go-to things for getting them to talk and engage and that kind of thing. But I do think at that age, it would be helpful to have a man as a therapist. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. That makes a lot of sense. I, I had the, the younger children in mind. I think I uh, teenage boys scare me, so I don't. <laughs> that wouldn't they can be, be happy but... <laughs> sometimes. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah. Well, Are... they just—they're just kind of have all that testosterone starting to like surge, and they can become aggressive sometimes. And you just have to say, you know, you're gonna have to leave. You're gonna be like that, you know, kind of thing. Like, sorry, yeah. you can't can't pound your fists on my desk and that kind of yeah. stuff. You're gonna have to go away but um, that doesn't happen too often and I feel like I have good rapport with most kids we don't really have too many disagreements and 
it's usually really good. And I do, I do think um, it is maternal, especially for those younger kids, especially if they've not had a mom that has attuned to them. I really love the term attune. And that just means to know your child, to know what their psychological, spiritual, emotional needs are at any moment. Like you've really known them so well, you know them so well that you're able to look at them, to hear them and to perceive what their needs are. And a lot, and that's really what we're looking for. I can't remember who said it, but um, that everyone has come, everyone comes into the world looking for someone looking for us. And we're, we're wanting someone to know us, to understand us. And that first person should be a mom, should be parents. Um, and parents should be the one who are, who are caring most for our souls. Um, we should be caring for our children's souls more than anyone else. So I know that a lot of my kids have not experienced that. And I see it as an opportunity to provide that where it's not been provided. Mm. I sound like I'm putting myself on a pedestal. I'm not. It's just this is my role, and these are the gaps that that this role fills. No, I don't. I don't. I don't get that sense at all about the pedestal. No, I, this is your this is your your work, and it's uh, good and necessary work. And you know, families are in such a state that the work is, like I said, I'll repeat myself, necessary. So this is good. Um, do you think that? Some people describe like a tendency, uh, some people being me, I am some people, uh, this tendency for, I guess you could say like elite tastemakers to set certain standards, set certain cultural standards that basically, or pretend to, that they, they may, or not, may or may not actually live by, but um, the, 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 the concept itself sort of trickles down to people who can't afford to do it and mm. may, it makes their lives much worse. Mm -hmm. Like, mm -hmm. you know, the, the classic example would be like the sort of fashionable Hollywood, uh, oh, I guess it, Hollywood people do get divorced, but they can sort of afford to, I don't know. What would a better example be? Just I, I, promiscuity is a good example. A lot of the, a lot of mm. really, really wealthy people don't actually, engage it like they're they're not they're actually sexually very discretionary but because yes. they've sort of memed that practice into reality a lot of like mm -hmm. lower class people sort of believe that it's like we were saying earlier that it's normal that it's good and it ruins their lives yes yes um yes. do you think that you that oh sorry go, go on oh, no i'm sorry go ahead sorry go ahead <laughs> well, I just, I, I, th I think about this in terms of like, in terms of the girl boss thing, this, this sort of like careerism for women, this women outside of the workplace thing, which was like this sort of, you know, Tom Wolf, radical chic tier, uh, uh, Betty Friedan and all of her Brooklynite friends talking about how they were so much better than these, uh, middle brow, middle America, um, sad, heavily medicated, whatever's women in the suburbs, right? And mm -hmm. and how like they were the enlightened ones who could do, who could who 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 needed to express their their intelligence in the workplace. And I feel like that meme, that den that meme, which was built on the denigration of motherhood, trickled down. Um, and I sort of wonder about that and like the, like how the denigration of motherhood plays out in these, uh, you know, lower class communities. I mean, it seems, it seems like it's, it seems like it's there, but I mean, what does that look like? Or does, does what I'm saying make sense? First of all, <laughs> I understand what you're saying. And, and what I want to say to that, and, and if anybody's listening, I would recommend the book by Theodore Dalrymple, um, Life at the Bottom where he addresses this specific thing. And he talks about how the elitists all have these kind of progressive Marxist views, but they don't actually live those out. And rather they do trickle down to the underclass where they act them out. And it kind of creates this, you know, disparity between the elite, a, a greater disparity between the elite and the lower class, because the lower class has taken on those values that the that the elites say they 
appreciate, condone, whatever, but they actually don't practice, they just trickle on down to the, the lower class, um, the underclass, whatever you want to call them, the low income populations. Um, like divorce, there, there's no, there are no, I would say out of 32 kids that I have, I would say maybe three have intact families. Maybe three. Yeah. That's not an exaggeration. Like two, like two parents, mom and dad at home from, from birth. No. Um, lots of, lots of different family situations. Maybe mom has had boyfriends over the years. Um, multiple boyfriends, maybe, maybe dad has custody and he's a single dad and he's got five daughters. I actually know that very situation and it's like, wow, you know, you can imagine what, what that's, and he's, he's a great dad, but you know, those girls, it would, they would benefit from having, you know, a mom. So, um, I don't know that really, that doesn't really answer your question, but I will say it very much is the elite have a certain ideology that they don't actually live by. But those concepts do impact the lower class. They do impact yeah. low income populations. It's very strange how that works. And um, Dalrymple goes, he does a much better job of explaining how that all actually happens. I would highly recommend that book um, because he really does go into that in depth. Yeah. Something I was actually thinking about that I wanted to say here that I think you that would be interesting because of what you talk about. We we are very much fixated on the destruction of the family and how how families the nuclear family has been denigrated and destroyed in the last especially twenty to thirty years. But what I'm seeing now and it's just kind of coming to my view is not only have we denigrated and and dissolved the family really. But we're, we've made people so unmarriable that family formation isn't even beginning. Like we've completely, we're, we're preventing even family formation because there's just nobody up there that's like marriage material. Um, yeah. And you've got some really disgruntled, you know, adults who, wa who want to be married, but there is just no one who is marriage material. And it's almost like this, this thing is going on that is preventing the formation. Like, let's make everybody so terrible and toxic that nobody wants to get married to each other. And we won't even, the family won't even be formed at that point. And then we'll just have, you know, people having children, you know, outside of marriage and, you know, all these crazy surrogate situations. It And it even gets destroyed before it even starts. And I just think that is really concerning. Yeah. Oh, man. Boy, do I agree with you. My something that I say that is fairly controversial, but I mean, never stopped me. But um, is that you know, uh, misogynists and misandrists are both right about a lot. <laughs> they're really here's the thing: they're both right, right in many ways in diagnosing the opposite sex, but they are incapable of being honest about their own feelings. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yes, and that that really right. is the problem, you know. Yes, it's like mm -hmm. you know when 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 uh, women who hate men talk about how. Uh, you know, they all watch porn and they all, and, and, and they're, they're gross and they have, they view women in this extremely sort of degraded, uh, way. It's like, well, that's true. <laughs> I mean, that is true for a lot of people, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. but, yeah. but at the same time, these very same women are degrading themselves almost as an act of rebellion, which is totally like counterintuitive and counterproductive because mm -hmm. uh, you're playing into the very thing that you say that you hate about men. Um, and like and a therefore, protective factor. I don't know if it's like a protective factor in a way. It's like I'm going to yeah. make myself repulsive. I don't know, right? Or just like hard, me. really like yeah, yeah. Just like this, like really hard outer shell. I think um, women yeah. are afraid. So there, there's. We could talk about like masculinity and femininity, femininity discourse a little bit because this is sort of what it goes into what you're saying, right? Like the people who become unmarriageable, well. Women don't feel free to, they don't feel free to be feminine and soft right. and trust yes. men. Yes. Um, and then, and then men don't feel equipped to act mm -hmm. like men. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. So th there's like this stalemate where it's like, okay, 
who needs to bend first? Yes. Uh, yeah. I may I actually tweeted today. I was like, I think all women, all girls should get off of dating apps and they should not have public instas. Single girls should not do that because they're just giving images of their beautiful faces out to men who have not earned them. You know, not not yeah. that there has to be this earning thing, but, you know, when I was growing up, if you gave your picture to a boy, it was because you really liked him and you trusted him and you had you gave him like, you know, a photo, a physical photo of, you know, your yearbook picture or a snapshot your mom had taken or something on vacation. And that was like a special thing that he had that in, like you think about even past times when people went off to war. I mean, my granddad kept a photo of my grandmother and his wallet, you know, when he went or when his, you know, when he went to war. And that was just this really special thing where you trusted the person, you loved the person. And this was kind of like a token, an intimate token of that trust. And now with digital images, we, you know, I've talked about the ubiquity of female images online. There's none of that intimate trust anymore. It's here's, I've, I'm putting myself on display. Um, and anybody can look, anybody can view. You didn't have to do anything to earn my trust. Here it is anyway. And that's, and I just feel like women in some way have been conditioned to do that. Like they, they just, that's, that's the culture now. That's what you do. You have this and you put it out there and you do the dating app and things like that. And, and I feel, like I said, I feel for women. I have compassion for young women who desire to be married, who desire to have families. And they are kind of stuck in this, like, there's nobody to marry. You know, they're all, yeah. They all have porn brain. They all have, you know, whatever, you know, they, I can't marry anybody. Um, yeah. But I'm just like, talking about who makes the first step I don't know but I think if women just completely said we're not going to do a dating apps we're not going to put our pictures online for men to look at for free and and you know we're not we're not giving that away we're just going to exit I don't know it's that's probably being a little hyperbolic a little crazy but <laughs> just like don't give your beauty away for you know I don't know I just I just love young women I want to protect them I wish that I, there are many things that I wish people had said to me when I was younger that I want to say now. I feel this some kind of like weird biological inclination to protect young women to say, look, I know that you can't see this is what's happening to you right now or this is what's coming in at you. But this is this is what's actually happening. And you can protect yourself from that. Um, I just have this burning yeah. desire to protect. Yeah. Yeah, I do too. I do too. I think I think if you've been uh, damaged in any way by this mm -hmm. sort of culture, it you either women tend to either go one of two directions, and it sort of goes back to what I was saying at the beginning: whether or not you're you can, whether or not God has given you the grace to contend with the weight of the tragedy, mm -hmm. or or you know you haven't accepted that. Mm -hmm. And I think the women who can't accept that will double down on mm -hmm. feminism mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and they will turn around and look at young women and give them the worst advice that you could possibly receive, you know, yes. sleep around, never trust a man, do your yeah. career, all that crap, mm -hmm. which sure. is, this is all stuff that I have heard from mm -hmm. these women's mouths, you know, mm -hmm. um, in fact, I heard a lot more of that than, than anything else. Um, but anyway, um, I, I, I just think that sometimes if you, if you can't, if you can't be honest about how, how damaged you've been by your own decisions, mm -hmm. yeah, you feel your only option is to double down and to make everybody else join you, you know, misery loves company sort of thing. Mm -hmm. But I think yeah. it's happening on a subconscious level, actually. I don't think, I don't think these women are actively, actively, you know, consciously trying to hurt other women. They're just hurt themselves. Yes. I mean, it, it really is that way. Um, you know, I, t I tell my students that I see and I tell young girls that I've mentored over the years, you know, tell the truth about yourself to yourself. Like, don't lie to yourself about yourself. Don't pretend that you want something that you really don't want. Don't lie to yourself. I feel like we are so conditioned to like make ourselves believe that we want something that we really don't believe. And I can't remember which guest you had. 
I tried to go back and look and see which episode it was, and I could not find it. But just she was talking about what women have come to accept in terms of just romance, like romance, um, sexual encounters. You know, they've they've degraded themselves and made themselves believe that they will that they like all this sexual degradation and feel like a man holding their hand is like this you know strange thing and i just it breaks my heart that women have you know degraded themselves and made and made themselves believe lies mm -hmm. and made the, and pretended to want something or like something that they truly didn't want or didn't like Right, or maybe they they liked the attention in the short term and and uh, weren't thinking about the long term, because mm -hmm. to be fair, like the 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 culture does not make that clear, make those long term consequences clear, and the technology the technology also conceals and sort of you know mystifies that you know you can always get an abortion if you're on birth control, mm -hmm. you can avoid all these consequences. Yeah. We have antibiotics. For mm -hmm. STDs, you know, yeah. there's like the yeah. permanence of bad decisions isn't mm -hmm. is it isn't really palpable anymore. So we're, it mm -hmm. almost feels like we're living in this like you know a layer of reality that's just above real. <laughs> I don't know. Yes. Yeah, I think that's one reason I've really kind of been bearing down with the memento mori type mentality for so long. The you know keeping eternity in mind thinking about eternal consequences. I love the Flannery O'Connor story, A Good Man is Hard to Find, where the grandma kind of like starts acting how she should have acted toward the end. And he shoots her anyway. And he says she would have been a good woman if somebody had been, you know, shooting her every moment of her life. Like, we, sh that's what he says, you know, like, if somebody who had a gun to her head and shot her every day of her life, or every moment of her life, whatever he says, she would have been a good woman. And we, that's the memento mori, con you know, concept. It's like, you could die right now. You could die right now. And living with that eternal perspective, like, what are the consequences, what are the eternal consequences of this decision? How does this affect my eternal soul? Mm -hmm. And really thinking about facing the moment of your death every day of your life, like, how can I live this day so that if it is my last, I'm ready to move into the next world, and I'm not leaving yeah. this you know, messy legacy, this messy life behind. Um, I've left something beautiful and good and intact. And, you know, it's a positive spiritual legacy that I'm leaving. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So I think what you're saying is we are so like looking at, like we can see right here, we're not looking beyond the hand in front of our face. And yeah. that's why I think it's like so important to talk about eternity and to say, you will live forever in one place or another. Like, how can you prepare to move to the next life? How can you prepare for eternity? Yeah. Yeah, and I think, too, that um, that a lot of this conversation about psychology really misses that, mm -hmm. and the sort of therapy culture really misses that question. And if it if it hadn't missed that question, and if, if, if it really doubled down on that question, it would actually help people's mental health. Yes, like, yes. I, th I think we have this, like, very wrong headed idea that um, the weight of eternity is too much. And, you know, we all have like a complex about guilt and how it's like this bad thing and mm -hmm, mm -hmm. that destroys your life. And it's like, no, not when it's properly ordered. You know, the right, key is right. that the key, the key is good catechesis. The key is, is understanding God's will that has mm -hmm. been revealed to us, right. you know? So like, um, anyway, I just think that the therapy culture now might even be a good time to talk about Harry and Meghan, <laughs> oh, but, <Lord>. um, <laughs> but no, I think that the, I think that the therapy culture is really, is really oh. missing something big. What, mm -hmm. what do you think about therapy culture in general as somebody who, you know, Oh, I think it can be so woo-woo therapy. I think, yeah. I think it can be so woo-woo sometimes. And I, 
you know, I sit through some courses sometimes, like continuing ed courses and stuff like that. And I'm just like, oh, roll my eyes. Because they, if you are not talking about eternity, like if you're not talking about m moving from the profane to the beautiful, from the from the bad to the good, from the lies to the truth, if you're not think if you're not thinking about therapy in that way, you are wasting your time. If you do not have an eternal perspective. And also I would say this about what I think therapy culture misses. Not all therapy culture, but a lot, a lot of the modern, like a the the new stuff, the contemporary stuff. I just feel like there's this whole missing of the human condition. I feel like they there's this kind of 2D idea of people and they don't consider really the condition of humanity and there's no like real curiosity about a person it's just like okay here are your symptoms here are these here's this checklist of things to work on to maybe fix these symptoms but they've never really addressed the root problem um was it Thoreau said for every thousand hacking at branches one is hacking at the root or something like that they just see these symptoms they medicate the symptoms they give very shallow, like, you know, just do some mindful breathing, just do some if-then thinking, you know, just, you know, just maybe draw a picture or something like that. Rather than somebody saying, oh, your dad threw a beer bottle at you and it shattered against the wall beside your head and then he stabbed your grandma, that is evil. That's evil. That What your dad did is evil. And you should have never, ever had to see that. It should not be that way. Rather than like saying it's evil, that's terrible. I'm sure that had a long lasting effect on you and calling it what it is, which is evil. Or when parents show up and they their children are watching horror movies at five and they can talk about Pennywise when they're like five years old, rather than saying, okay, well, you know, let's reduce screen time by 15 minutes every day you know how about this is evil and profane and your child should not be watching it because their brain is for forming little neural pathways and they're absorbing all this stuff and you're wondering why they're destroying classrooms and it's probably because they're watching Pennywise when they're five years old you know it's like helping people make those connections but what I see in the therapy world is this fear of saying anything is wrong or evil or bad yeah. I, I mean, I will sit in in sessions with 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 other therapists, and I'll say, "Well, I don't want to, you know, I don't feel like it's my place to say this is bad. You know, this is their life, this is what they're choosing, and there's just this refusal to say this is bad for your child. This is evil. This is dark. This should not be happening. This is what's happening in your child's brain when they watch that. There's just a refusal to do that because there's this." You know how how democratic liberalism kind of trickles down it's like everything is equal everything is valid no, nothing is superior to something else and then you right yeah, that's what happens and so you can't say oh you know letting your child watch pennywise when they're five years old is not good because everything's equal everything's valid and nothing is superior to something else in terms of like a moral judgment yeah wow yeah, it's That's crazy. A very interesting mm -hmm. point. Yeah. Yeah. Are you um, are you concerned at all about the over medication of people like the just like the what do you think about SSRIs and the fact that like everyone, you know, is taking them? Yeah, um, it's I think it's really tragic. I think, you know, I work mostly with children, so I have a lot of kids who are on medication a lot and I have some parents who are really great and who are willing to say you know I can say to them I would love for you to take them off for six months so that I can get a baseline because when they come to me and they've been taking medication for a long time I don't really know who they are I'm getting like a medicated version of them so I have some parents that are willing to say okay I'll take I'll take her off for six months we'll see how she's doing um but Matthew Peterson wrote this beautiful thread on Twitter about how we kind of have created an army of broken people. Like we break people. We're, we're just, we've created this, this army of, you know, broken medicated people. I don't know that he said medicated, but I can say medicated 
And rather than, like I said before, addressing the root problem, everything is is addressed with medication from a very young age. Right. And it's, it's really fun. It's not funny, but it, it is sometimes when kids say funny things. They really believe, especially my younger kids, they really believe that this pill that they're taking is kind of like their magic pill. And there's this whole generation now of kids that I'm seeing that, that will become adults who have depended on SSRIs or stimulants or sleeping pills, because most of my kids who are on stimulants also take a sleeping pill. Not all, but a lot of them do. They are mm-hmm. so dependent on this medication that they believe it is what keeps them from being angry. It's what keeps them from disrupting the classroom, that kind of thing. And I I had one kid last year who insulted us, a staff member. Really, it was a pretty bad insult. And he said, well, I just said that because I didn't take my pill this morning. And they're, they're, and so they, oh, oh, I can tell some (laughs) hilarious stories. They're just so funny. But he, he said, I just, you know, I was bad because I didn't take my pill. Hello. You know, he was in second grade, second grade, you know, so (laughs) they really are so dependent on this medicine and believe that it is their magic pill. And I don't know what that looks like in 15, 20 years. Um, I know with my boys' students, um, I see a lot of stunted growth, especially when they've been on stimulants for a long time. I mean, they're very small. Um, Most of my boys that I've seen ages like, I don't know, 8 to 14 who have been taking stimulants for a long time, they are much smaller than other boys. It's like they've, they've not developed at the rate that other boys have developed. Um, and one, one of my students, one of my girls currently, she was taking a stimulant. She has gone off the stimulant and she refuses to go back on it because she said, I cannot live where I didn't want to eat. She never ate when she took it. And then she had to take a a sleeping pill to counteract the stimulant at night. And she said she feels so much better off of it. Now there's a lot of stuff that we're having to work on now because she's not taking anything to reduce those behaviors, but she said she feels so much better. And when you feel, oh gosh, you know, that makes it, when you can actually eat meals, eat food and have like nutrients in your body makes a huge difference. Mm-hmm. So I'm, I'm really concerned that we have a generation of kids who have been taking pills since a very early age and are very dependent on those and believe that they cannot function without them. It's very much one nation under therapy, one, one nation under like therapeutic medication or psychological not yeah. psychological, one psychological, nation psychiatric, under pharma. psychiatric medication yes yeah. yes yeah sorry that was enough for so it. one of the best no no that's fine yeah i one of the best things my mom ever ever did i think um it's really such a heroic motherhood um story but my brother had um a, as a as a baby he developed an ear infection that basically didn't go away for like a year mm. And, um, you know, I don't know if that was, I don't know if that, what, what, what caused it could have been vaccine related or I'm, you know, we're not sure. Right. But, um, he, you know, had this horrible reaction and was basically deaf for about a year. Mm -hmm. Um, and no, no doctor could identify it. And like, it was, it was a real problem. And so by the time he was like three years old, he was not talking at Mm. all. He wasn't saying words. Mm. Uh, My brother and I are like 15 months apart. I was always highly verbal. And, you know, he was like, I, like people thought he was my retarded brother. That sounds Mm. horrible because my brother is amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, he's Mm -hmm. an aerospace engineer now. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. (laughs) Um, But like, but the the difference and where he should have been and where he was was like so stark So anyway, all these doctors were telling my mom, you have to put him on medication. You have to put him on Ritalin. You have to put him on this and that and this Mm -hmm. and that and this and that. And my mom just recoiled and she was like, that doesn't feel right. Like, I know my daughter and I know my son and I know they can communicate very well. I know he's not autistic. I, you know, I know that there's something else going on here. Mm -hmm. Um, And... So she refused to put him on any medication. She she went the crunchy route, mm-hmm. and she's not even a particularly like you know crunchy person. She's right. definitely not a hippie, you know. But um, she she decided to do basically like a a detox, really clean up 
everybody's diet and took the TV out of our house for, you know, the first five years of our life mm -hmm. and, um, just tried to figure it out with my brother, took him to like phonics and therapy and all that stuff. And like the ear infection somehow finally went away. Mm. And then by the time he was six, he was reading through Harry Potter completely on his own. I love it. So it's like, yeah. So, I mean, it was just like this amazing thing that she did just just being attuned to him. Mm -hmm. Yes. You know? Yes. And I, I sort of wonder how much how much that attunement would 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 be um a bulwark against these intrusions of like the medical industrial complex mm -hmm. which I've been critical of mm -hmm. on this podcast. Mm -hmm. But it it I, I, I see the same thing that you're seeing. I think that there's been, I mean, my generation, it would have been my brother. And if not for the absolute valor of my mother, you know, my brother, I could, he wouldn't be where he is today. Mm -hmm. And he's an, I mean, he's amazing and exceptional, mm -hmm. high IQ, mm -hmm. high verbal, high math, mm -hmm. like, so good. um, you know, yeah. Yeah. So, you know, I just wonder, I, I, I kind of, I can appreciate all of these moms who are now sort of reevaluating and taking a step back. I think there is a genuine, genuine like countercultural movement that's beginning mm -hmm. to be skeptical, mm -hmm. but it is countercultural and it is small. So yes, yes, I really try when I do meet with parents. I try to just reassure moms they are the best. You are the best mom for your child. You have everything you need to be the mom that this person needs. Even if they are not currently exhibiting all those right things, it can be learned, it can be channeled. Um, and giving them options. I had one mom who was like, I think the school's making my daughter crazy. I'm like, okay, well, let's move her out. You know, I'm not gonna advocate to keep her in a place that you think is bad for her. If you think this is a bad place for her, let's move, let's, I will work to move you out of the school. Like it. Let's do it. So whenever moms do give me those little nuggets of like, I think this might be good. Great. Yes. And just giving them a lot of praise for knowing and loving their child and saying, you know, you're such a good advocate for your child. Just re like affirming those things that maybe no one has ever said to them. Like I said earlier in the in the episode or in our talk, um, what I said to another woman, like teach these women like to love their children and to like have confidence in their ability to perceive their child's needs, to advocate for them, to love them, to support them, encourage them. That's really what is so needed. Mm -hmm. Yes, that's so beautifully said. Um, I, yeah, I actually, I have the book here too, because <laughs> yes, I was hoping we might be able to yeah, talk about it great. just a little bit. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Um, so this is Being There by Erica Kamazar. We hope that that is how you pronounce it, although it's sort of a morbidly pronounced <laughs> last name. I hope she never watches this episode. She might. Yeah. Kamazar. Oh boy. <laughs> um, but and, anyway, um, what was your favorite part of the book or what do you think was the most interesting part of the book? I really appreciated that she, um, talked about ways that you can be present with your child. I think that we think it's like some very formal thing, but it really is just like talking to your baby um, interacting with your baby, playing with your baby. And um, I, I love that she talked about how um, ADHD, ADD, which are kind of all over the place now. I, think, I feel like every child has ADHD or, AD, or ADD. Um, that they mm -hmm. learn, that babies learn to focus and they learn how to develop an attention span through interacting with their moms. Um I'm trying to think. I took, actually took several notes. I'm like looking through my notes right now. I took several notes about it. Um, I feel like she talked a little bit about unrealistic expectations about pregnancy, motherhood, that kind of thing. Um, that was really helpful. Um, she said nurturing mothers usually produce nurturing mothers. And we kind of talked a little bit about that. Like what I see is probably yeah. kind of like this generational thing of moms who have not seen good mother, good mother modeled um what did you think what were right. your thoughts well i just i thought it was a very uh I, the section about um where she just outright asked the question why do we belittle the nurturing mm -hmm. professions mm -hmm. 
and, and, um, which I'll get to in a second, but, um, well, actually, I, I, why don't I just read uh, read a bit of that? Go ahead. Um, give everybody mm-hmm. a taste yeah. of that. Um, okay, so uh, in the distant past, cultures glorified the power of giving and nurturing life. Today, many women see themselves as warriors in the pursuit of power, money, and work equality, and have turned away from nurturing as too soft and without substance. And yet they miss the point that mothering is the concrete foundation of a house that withstands the storms later. Mm -hmm. Becoming a stronger woman has come to mean being like a man and delegating mothering to strangers who are condescended to, paid low wages, and given little job security and little respect. Many of these caregivers leave their own children to care for others' children, a painful choice that many would dearly love to avoid. I'll just read one more paragraph. Go. Uh, As more lucrative opportunities in the traditionally male-dominated fields have opened, more women have turned away from the nurturing professions like teaching, counseling, nursing, speech, and physical therapy, massage therapy, and nutrition, which traditionally have given them flexibility and more control over their lives. The problem is that professions like law, finance, business management, tech, and even being a physician are not usually family-friendly, and to compete with men... Women have to make work their priority. Fear has replaced control. Fear of loss of a job, fear of loss of a spot at work, fear of having less money, a fear of a loss of self, which I want to talk about, by the way, um, which is often intensely connected to work. In many industries, work is more like a pair of golden handcuffs. Instead of challenging the status quo, women have bought in hook, line, and sinker. This is in spite of the fact that new research from Cornell has found that when women enter a field in large numbers, the pay declines for the same job that men were doing before. This occurs not just in jobs that require more education. Female physicians make uh, 71% of what male physicians earn, but in jobs that require less skill. Janitors earn more than maids and housekeepers. Women's work, no matter what that work is, simply isn't valued as highly. <laughs> and now, okay, that being said, like I, the the latter part of that, and the um, I think that uh, I, I I don't believe that the gender wage gap is real in the way that right. people True. say that it's real. But I do um, I do think it's very interesting that that, that just just this this cultural sleight of hand that women have come to accept and really internalize about their own unique gifts being essentially worthless. Mm -hmm. It's really what the podcast is about. Like that entire, (laughs) that entire paragraph was like why I started this. It's like, because, because I, you know, in the earlier part of my life, I was, I really applied myself in school and it was, you know, I, I, I was successful in, in various ways. I had a high status job Mm -hmm. that was, um, you know, it, it was fine, but it was when I, when I left in order to become a wife and become a mother, I felt the strange pressure from a lot of the women in my life, well, you're not giving that up, are you? How could you? How could you ever give something like that up? How could you give up your mind? How could you give up your brains? How could you give up yourself? You know, mm. it's like I never felt like that's what I was doing. Mm-hmm. And I almost feel like women need like permission from other women or something to to not be engaged in this way. Like there's this intense yeah. social pressure. I don't know. What do you think about that? No, I I agree. You know, it's funny because I never lived in that world because I got married so young and had children so young and I was a homemaker for so long. So I I just always from a very young age aimed toward aimed for that um, and mm. just anticipated that my career would come later, which it did. Um, and I that's kind of what I tend to encourage women to do. I'm like, that will wait. That can wait. You, when you're like in your, like get married young, have children young. And when you're in your mid thirties, your kids will be older and you can have more flexibility. And 35 is still very young. I know to the twenties, to the 20 year old girls, 35 feels so old, but 35 (laughs) is so young. And, you know, I think Mary Harrington's talked about this. I think other people you've had on your podcast have talked about this. Just 
take those years, um, develop your your family, be a mom, and, and the career can wait. But I think that you're, so, so a lot of stuff that you talk about, it's not foreign from a, from the point that I don't, I can't see it or, or understand what people are experiencing, but I did not, that's not the path mm-hmm. I went down. So I never felt this, yeah. that, that tug or pull or like, oh, you're giving up, up something um, for, you know, like mothering is, is less than or what you're, what you're leaving behind. Um, that was just not something I ever yeah. experienced. Do you think that that had, has anything to do with where you grew up? It's possible. People have often said that. Like, it was very much the culture to get married very young and to have children very young. That was just what was expected of you. It wasn't, um, you weren't kind of, ex- you really weren't expected to go to college and have a career. You were expected to get married and have a family. And that's what I did. Yeah. So. Did you find that expectation oppressive? No. I never did. I thought it was wonderful. I loved writing Homemaker when it was like, you know, what's your job set as Homemaker? I loved it. I loved it. I loved it. I was so proud of that. I was like so proud of being at home. Yeah. Yeah. I was so proud. Well, I think so. My mom, um, when I was, I, so I, I was born in 95. Like, so I grew up in like the late nineties, early aughts. Mm -hmm. And my parents at some point moved from the North to the South, where is, which is where I grew up really. Mm -hmm. But, um, she's often talked about the difference in culture, um, from, from there to here and the way that, um, you know, women were much more supportive and sort of had a generally positive view of homemaking in the South. I don't know if that's true anymore because of this like internal immigration problem. Oh, don't have. even get me started. Don't even Yankees. get me started. I get so whatever about it. I'm like, just bring your yeah. progressive ideology to my hometown to stay go away yes but it, it probably is stay in so, so whenever i hear you know those types of things women feeling the tug between a career and a high status job and being at home i just that wasn't something that i ever experienced i never had that moment um i feel grateful that i've been able to that my life has been on a certain trajectory and I've been able to, you know, start my career later. My boys are older and I'm almost an empty nester at this point. Um, mm-hmm. And, you know, I feel, I feel good about that. I, I think Noelle Maring does such a good job about, she does, she's so good about saying this, especially in her book, Theology of Home, which everybody should go get. I have no stake in that book or anything, but I think it's a wonderful book. Um, I would throw out every book I had on mothering and raising a family and just get that book. And that would be sufficient Um, because she really, (laughs) yeah, it is such a great book about um, empowering women in that role as homemakers, Mm -hmm. as um, wives, moms, and just kind of what God has given you the responsibility to do and embracing that and loving it and, and cultivating a life that's really beautiful and good and nourishing for your children like i said before we should be caring about our children's souls the most you know more than anybody and and just creating a a home environment that that does nourish and enrich their souls that does help them get to heaven i mean ultimately that's our goal is to move our children heavenward to move them godward and um just think that that's like what greater what greater role is there than that yeah. Very well put. Yeah. I, it's, it's a, it's a, it's a crying shame that, um, that there's been this inversion and I think it, it was, I think it was like an early 20th century thing, but the way that I see it is that historically, if the economic was subjected to the familial mm-hmm. in the sense that the economic was sort of pursued in service of the familial, there was a there was a, an inversion that happened recently where the I mean relatively recently where the the, the familial now operates in service of the economic yes. and the highest goods are material yes. and um, 
And that's a real problem. It's a real problem. Yeah. It's not that economic goods aren't licit because they are. Mm -hmm. It is good to pr material pr materially provide for a family. I think it's especially good for men to mm -hmm. materially provide for their families. Mm -hmm. And it's not morally bad, obviously, for women to to do things and to be engaged in commerce, which is a, a, a straw man that a lot of people sort of throw at uh, you know traditionalists. But mm -hmm. but anyway. Um, but yeah, it's just, it's the orientation, it's the telos, it's, mm -hmm. it's why, why are we doing what we're doing? Yes, right. I, uh, I, I wrote about this, uh, something I encountered with the uh, Early Childhood Commission in my state. I was just so, I don't know, taken aback. They presented this whole thing about how much tax revenue that had been lost whenever mothers left the workforce in 2020 when COVID hit. And a lot of women had to end up staying at home, had to pull their kids out of daycare because daycares were closed. And a lot of those women never returned to the workforce. They were like, oh, we're living the good life here with our kids at home. And they didn't want to go back to the workforce. And they, I think the, it was like $591 million or something they had lost in tax revenue with um, moms not working. And so they had started this initiative to get, to move those women back into the workforce to, provide low cost or free child care for these women so they could yeah so they could go back to work make you know not that much money and their income could be taxed to pay for the free or low cost child care for their children it was just, it was terrible i mean it was just really clear to me the state hates mothers <laughs> they do they don't want right. good for children they do not want as good for women they just want tax revenue and it taxable was, heads yes. yes 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 so that yeah. was really um it was really eye-opening for me to be a part of that but um yeah 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 this is like the underlying oh it is it is well, isn't it? oh my gosh we've been here for we're just been chatting, an hour and 15 minutes like wow. i'm sorry I'm glad. yeah I'm, you're good i'm happy to talk <laughs> why should i gotta get to bed i got these babies they're gonna be up yes. in no time but anyway um I, I will say one thing like um this is why it's, it's this is that what you've just described. It's why is why it's so difficult for me to call myself a feminist, mm -hmm. even though all of my work is is about, you know, how, how can we improve women's lives, you know, and how can we as women live better lives and help each other? Um, and uh, I it's that underlying economic reality of the feminist movement mm -hmm. that is it's almost communistic in nature. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Like there's this interview between Vladimir Lenin and Clara Zetkin where they basically lay out the current paradigm in America, the current economic paradigm mm -hmm. in America, where most child care, which itself is a euphemism, is outsourced to people who are totally who just don't care yeah. about your kid. 100%. And what does that do like down the road? Like, well, how does that, these emotional, that I think that actually creates deep, as she writes, yes. deep abandonment wounds mm -hmm. that last a lifetime. Yes. That, that attachment is forming in those early years, those early months, those early years. That's when secure attachments are developed. And when she talks about this, when you have, when you're consistently away from your child for several hours a day, days on end, like, you know, five days a week, eight hours a day for the bulk of their developmental year, zero to three, there's there's that that attachment that doesn't form properly um, because you've had you've had the separation more than you've actually been with them. So there's a lot of insecure attachment that develops and, you know, emotional insecurity um, lack of coping skills, things like that. Yes, they, they manifest mm -hmm. differently as children get older, depending on, you know, kind of predisposed personality traits. Right. Mm -hmm. Right. Well, let's, let's round this out because it is getting late yeah. here. Um, although great. I could, I could really like actually see myself talking to you all night. I know. I just, just wish we had some wine. <laughs> well, yes, that would be nice. I should have brought my little, brought a little glass. A little yeah, next time, next time we'll have yeah. a little bit wine night. Well, but, um, yes, right. this is so great, Helen. I love this um, so much. Yeah, 
Oh my gosh. Well, thank you so much for coming on. I do want to ask you that question that I like to ask people at the end of the podcast, though. What your advice for my average listener who is in her like late 20s um, and is sort of reconsidering these things. She may be single, she may be married, but she's sort of figuring out a way to arrange her life that, you know, uh, maximizes her potentiality for virtue. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. So what, what advice would you have for her? Um, well, I've said it before earlier in what we were talking about, just tell the truth to yourself about yourself. Like don't lie to yourself about what you want. Don't pretend to like something that you don't like. Don't pretend to want something you really don't want. Like just be honest about what you really want and who you really are. Um, and I would say take all of your, all of your hopes and all of your cares like everything that burdens you down and everything that you hope for and and entrust those to the Lord and just say, Lord, I give everything to you. It's yours, the good and the bad, my hopes, my dreams and all the things that I'm concerned about. And I'm trusting you with them um, that, that he will care for you. Um, I recommend everybody to I wish I could recommend this. I recommend this to my students, but I don't say it in a religious context. Really spend time like. Us in silence in prayer, meditation, meditating on scripture, um, religious texts, you know, maybe a C.S. Lewis or Thomas Aquinas, whatever you want to read, um, and just spend time, like, thinking about that and cultivate a rich inner life. Um, I think that helps you develop your sense of self when you have that rich inner life. And then just always think about, like, the eternal consequence of your decisions and your actions and think about what positive consequence does this have on eternity what negative consequences does this have in eternity and just always you know bring that eternity to bear on your thoughts your actions and just kind of how you live your life that's what i would say that's what i wish somebody oh, had gosh, said to me whenever well, i was like 25 mm -hmm. yeah absolutely yeah. Well, thank you so much you, for that great advice great. and for yes. just like this awesome combo. Yeah, yeah. so good. We'll definitely mm -hmm. have to have you back on. <laughs> I love that. I just, I'm so grateful that you'd have me on and let me share a little bit of my work and um, I'm sure we'll be in touch. Yeah, definitely. And um, just, just so everybody knows, I, I, I will repeat, not that anybody of you aren't aware of this already, but all of uh, Going Godward's links are going to be in the description box. And you should definitely follow her on Twitter. She's a really good follower, very thoughtful. And, you know, if you're on Twitter, which I'm actually sort of trying to get off. But, <laughs> but if you are on there, day, she is a good follower. I'm not going to be on Twitter. It's not today, but one yeah. day I'm going to be on Twitter. <laughs> but it's a great place to connect right. and network and, and just get to know some really great people. Yeah. Yeah, totally. Amen. Amen.